Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton-Lokes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. We are continuing with uh, looking at design. This time we are looking at, and let me, there we go, pumps and compressors. Basically, we're looking at the types of devices we use for pressure changes. To get started, we need to look at the extended Bernoulli equation. You'll recall this from when you studied fluid mechanics. Basically, if you do a mechanical energy balance, what you find is that the total change in energy properties of the fluid, so pressure drop, change in kinetic energy, and change in potential energy, will be equal to the path-dependent portions, which can be summarized as the shaft work and the drag forces. Now, the way it's set up by dividing through by g, the gravitational acceleration, all of these have units of length. We can talk about these in terms of fluid head. We have the pressure head, the velocity head, the height head, the shaft head, and then the friction head. And most of the time, we will use these using the units of feet of water. For liquids for sure, but sometimes even for gases, we can frequently just ignore the potential energy and the loss terms for the across the pump or compressor. And in those cases, if the volume change is small, then we can approximate the power as the molar flow rate times the molar volume times the pressure change across the pump. Now this will be better for a pump than for a compressor, where I would expect more of a volume change. But the nice thing about looking at it in this way is, if we have a similar flow rate and a similar change in pressure, one thing I can see is that the molar volume will make a large difference. And what this means is that if I have a fluid and I'm going to work with it sometimes in my process as a liquid and sometimes as a gas, I'm going to always do much better to pump a liquid than to compress that gas because the volume is smaller for the liquid. And so therefore, whenever I've got a stream that I'm trying to change both pressure and temperature, if I've got a phase change, try and do the pressure change first and then change the temperature to the gas phase. Of course, if you're going from gas to liquid, wait until it's to the cooler liquid phase and then change the pressure. You'll save a lot of money in your operations cost. Now there are many types of pumps and I'm only going to do a very brief review of these here and in class I'll give you some links to some manufacturers uh, information on this because they do a really great job of explaining how their equipment works. But there are three types of pumps, broad categories that we use primarily. Uh, centrifugal pumps are going to be the primary one we use. It's based on centrifugal forces to change the kinetic energy. A positive displacement pump is going to, well, have you ever put a, your finger over the top of a straw in your drink and then lifted that out and maybe opened your mouth and dropped the fluid into your mouth that way? If you've done that, you've worked with the principles behind a positive displacement front pump. I can't say that. Uh, these generally the two primary ways we do this will either be a reciprocating pump or a rotary pump and then we also have jet pumps and jet pumps use momentum transfer to move fluid and we frequently use these for like wells and things like that so if you have a water wheel on your property this would be the sort of pump you probably have there are a lot of pump characteristics that are going to make a difference, but the two that are most important are going to be the capacity and the head. And the capacity is that volumetric flow rate, uh, normally in gallons per minute or maybe cubic meters per hour if you're talking about a compressor. And then the head is from that extended Bernoulli equation. 
And so it's looking at the change from the suction side to the discharge side for our pump. Centrifugal pumps, again, these are going to be the mainstay of what we do in a chemical plant, bring material in through the suction eye into this rotating impeller, and it will throw the material outward, okay, because, right, that's what happens when you rotate equipment. It's going to throw the material outward. That will increase the pressure and kinetic energy, and this will then be collected on the discharge side and sent on to the next place. A centrifugal pump is one that you will have in one of your previous courses looked at characteristic curves or pump curves for these. And generally we have a flow rate versus a pressure head. And we look at both the head or how much pressure is on the discharge side and compare that to how much power we need. And we try and match this to where we find the maximum efficiency. And that's usually going to be somewhere, I don't know, it varies a lot, but it's going to not be at either end. It's going to usually be somewhere kind of in the middle of this set of curves. Now, the power that we're talking about here, they call that brake horsepower. And what you're going to need is to operate it to a discharge head that's a little bit more than what you really want. And then we'll use a control valve to throttle that back. Okay, and we need it to go to a slightly higher pressure so that we have room for operability. This is a simplified pump performance curve, and there's a great example in your book that I really recommend that you read. But they go through and look at this for various sizes of impellers. And if you look at the flow rate here and the head, so for instance at point alpha here where we have a 40 meter head, we have a flow rate of just less than 0.8 cubic meters per minute. And they talk about if you were to keep the same head but ch change impellers, for instance, you're able to, with a larger impeller, get a larger flow rate. When you go to a manufacturer, their curves are going to lo look a lot more complex because they have more information for more various sizes that you might possibly use. And again, I will link you to a video that's going to go through this with some great detail. Sometimes you only really have one characteristic curve and you just simply want to have a quick estimate. And so we have some simple relationships. Um, so N is the rotation rate, H is the head, D is the impeller diameter, and I can relate those to the volumetric flow rate. The relationship between rotation rate and volumetric flow rate is a linear one, inversely linear, uh, but head to rotation rate is going to be as the inverse of the rotation rate squared, and diameter kind of in a similar way. One of the, now, centrifugal pumps are great and we use them all the time, but they have a really serious problem, and that is cavitation. So when you have these high rates of rotation, you get high liquid velocities, and that can, at a location, just at that one spot, immediately lower the pressure. And if that pressure drops below the vapor pressure, then it's going to form a vapor bubble. Now that's fine, except for when that vapor bubble gets to a wall. So the impeller of your pump, uh, the veins on that, or the casing of the pump, it doesn't matter. When it hits that surface, it's going to slam into it with great velocity and burst with great force. This is incredibly noisy and it's destructive and it's called cavitation. Again, I have a link to a video that I'll show you, but there are many examples out there. Um, but you'll know you have cavitation in your system by the noise. But you can avoid it by planning ahead. And so to do that, what we want to do is look at the net positive suction head. And this is the pressure on the intake side of our valve. 
and we simply want to make sure that we have enough pressure on that side so that we will always be above the vapor pressure. And so that's going to be something that you want to always verify in your system. Uh, positive displacement pumps, I've got several different things in there, but what I want you to see is that it's snagging material and then moving it to the other side. It, this is positive displacement pumps are literally just physically moving equipment or material through the equipment. Jet pumps are taking advantage of momentum transfer. And so if you have something that's moving very fast through a narrow opening, it will snag the molecules near it and pull them with it. Okay, And so that can be used to great effect um, in places where, like I say, if you're trying to move things, a water well, something like that, or someplace where you're trying to get to a higher location, okay, without having to put a great deal of energy in it. Maybe you don't have electricity available or something like that. And so jet pumps are very useful for that. Doesn't mean they don't run with electricity, but they can be used in those ways. Now, when we're choosing the type of pump, um, the reason we usually choose the centrifugal pump is because the flow tends to be steady, okay? A rotary pump, like that one that we saw the working uh, animation, they can be fairly steady also. Reciprocating pumps are probably the worst for even flow. Um, but the centrifugal pump is going to be relatively low in efficiency. These positive displacement pumps, the reciprocating and rotary pumps, those are going to be our higher efficiency choices. So sometimes we do choose those, but they are going to cause operational issues if I need a very steady flow. Of course, another advantage of positive displacement pumps is the fact that they do not cavitate. Okay, cavitation is only an issue with centrifugal pumps. Um, when you have very viscous fluids, something kind of syrupy, a rotary pump is going to be nice because it's just physically grabbing the stuff and moving it. Um, reciprocating pumps, which are, uh, you frequently see these, say, when you drive past uh field with oil pumps out there. Okay, the ones that look kind of like a little horse heads bobbing up and down. Those are a reciprocating pump. And the nice thing about these is they seal very well. And so a lot of times if you have hazardous or toxic liquids, those are going to be the choice. But again, when it comes down to it, most of the time we choose a centrifugal pump because what we are after is a steady flow. Compressors and expanders, not quite so many choices. Basically, you're going to choose either a fan blower or compressor based on how much change to the velocity and pressure you want. So a fan is going to increase the velocity, but hardly change the pressure. A blower will increase the pressure, but it also changes the velocity. And a compressor will increase the pressure, but not change the velocity. Okay, so that's how you learn which of those you're wanting to do. Now, if you need to drop the pressure for a um, gas, you can use an expander or a turbine. Okay, it's a basically a reverse of a compressor. And that can recover power from the gas when you are dropping the pressure. You can do this for liquids, but it's fairly uncommon. Um... The options for compressors are pretty much the same as your pump options, weirdly. And reading the compressor curves is like reading a pump curve. The differences is going to be kind of the slopes of those lines that you're looking at, the materials of construction, the size that you're dealing with. Now also compressors typically are built in stages because usually a single stage can only about triple the pressure. And if you need a higher increase in pressure, you're going to need to put in multiple stages of compressors with cooling in between. Um, on expanders and turbines, usually they're built with lots of little teeny tiny blades and the fluid strikes the blades causing the shaft to turn. Um, 
And then this can generate power. So therefore you can actually have a cost recovery with these devices. For all of these devices we've discussed today, there are going to be isentropic efficiency concerns. And so you always need to know what your efficiency is. <clears throat> For a turbine, you're producing power. So it's the isentropic uh, power compared to the brake horsepower. And for a pump or compressor where you're requiring power input, it's going to be the brake horsepower divided by that isentropic efficiency. And finally, when you do need to decrease the pressure, for a gas stream, look at using a turbine to reclaim the energy. It may not be cost effective. If you're not going to get enough energy reclaimed to be, justify the cost of the equipment, then you need to, you know, look at just putting in a simple valve. There are valve systems for large gas lines also. Liquids, almost always a valve is going to be the simplest way to drop the pressure. It's possible that you'll be able to use a liquid turbine to great effect. But generally, we're just going to put a valve in a line as a way to drop the pressure. So this concludes this. Again, I'm going to give you some links to some other videos that I think are very good at showing the details of some of these operations. Thank you very much for your time.